down set. The most exciting game you will ever see on your TV set. Telstar by Coleco with three different games. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Laps Gamer Radio. Uh, we're back for the second time in as many weeks, which makes a nice change. Uh, this is going to be the first of our hopefully weekly catch-up shows where we'll talk about what we've been playing this week and briefly cover the news of the week. I'd like to welcome my co-hosts today, uh, Lee, Kev and Andy. Say hello. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. So, um, what have you been playing for the last week? Not a lot. Silly buggers, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> editing in your case, isn't it, Kev? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just been editing. <laughs> well, Lee, do you want to start us off? Yeah, okay. So I um, I think, was it last time I was talking about Kirby and the Rainbow Paintbrush? So I have dipped in a little bit more as I continue to kind of play through it for a second time in co-op with my son. He's like playing as the first Waddle Dee. I think you can actually do four player, but we're doing two player and... Um, his character kind of like uh, is able to do like tiered jumping, so almost like flying, which he, you know, my son enjoys greatly. And it makes it all a lot bit, a lot easier, really, because clearly the levels have been designed from the point of view of using the stylus. So um, he uh, he takes great relish in the fact that he kind of rescues me because what happens towards the end of the levels now in two players to kind of level the uh, difficulty. Uh, Clacia, I think that's her name, is like the enemy. In it's like these two disembodied hands, and she comes and grabs Kirby, and you're completely um, vulnerable to her attacks. So he, he then has to like jab her with the Waddle D spear to set me free. So yeah, now we've been having good fun with that. Just seeing like the percentage of the completion rate go up with the collectibles. Um, but then yeah, sort of turn to thinking what what to play next really, and what did I get? You know, in Santa's sack, uh, as it were. So I've been <laughs> trying. Um, Captain Toad Treasure Tracker. Now, Kev, I think, mentioned last time that this year, as one of his predictions, <laughs> may be the year of Toad, whereas, and he might get a game, whereas it's obviously already happened. Because <laughs> wow. this, this game came out, uh, I think it was the start of last year in the UK. It might have been slightly earlier in America. But if anyone's played the the Wii U, uh, was it Super Mario 3D World? You know, like you had um, occasional missions where you could play as Toad and you'd have to navigate this kind of compact puzzle arena to retrieve the star. Ultimately, this is a whole game that expands upon that idea. I haven't played much of it, I only played a few hours, and um, I was really quite startled for a moment to see the end credits roll, um, having played about 20 missions and only had two boss fights, all of which have been you know, really enjoyable. Um, but yeah, I thought, God, that is a bit short. <laughs> but no, then of course it's uh, got the tease of, a, of another episode that opens, and I suspect there's probably another one after that so as it stands i'm just about to start the sort of second episode as toadette um and the gameplay i, I suspect will be much the same you have to uh, avoid you can't jump you have to kind of like work your way your path out of how you're going to navigate around these various obstacles to uh, retrieve the star but there's also if you want to make it harder for you you can there's like other collectibles like other little gems i think there's three on each level there's also you know you can collect um, other things like stars to sort of or coins I think it is sorry to give you extra lives and you know there's a whole kind of range of ways of you can actually perfect a level so there's lots of replayability um, but the art style again is just breathtaking I mean I know that Nintendo as a company got by for a long time not necessarily needing HD graphics um, because they obviously always put the the actual art style ahead of photo realistic um, you know graphical uh, the way they approach it but it's just it looks so lush on a hd uh, telly so yeah really been enjoying that is that have you had any experience with that guys with this one none at all <laughs> no no <laughs> no i've only ever seen videos of it um i've been interested in picking it up basically you move the world round don't you like like in fez yeah so you can um you can do it all via uh, i guess like motion controls you know like with the gyroscope that's in the the gamepad so you could use that to turn you know like similar in a way i suspect that you've done it with splatoon you know like you can aim with the gamepad yeah. can't you, to shoot so you, yeah i turned that off as soon as possible though <laughs> <laughs> well, you, well you can you can do it that way but you also you can use the right stick um, and to be honest I, it's really like a combination of both that i feel most at home with like for certain aspects where you've got to look through 
tunnel or you need to look you need to rotate the world to be able to see what you know what's underneath or on the other side it's sometimes a lot easier just doing it with the uh, the right stick but it's it's um it's another one of those games that you can kind of play at your own pace so although there are there is peril in the sense that there are um, enemies i guess like on the, and it's kind of like a very very claustrophobic kind of compact puzzle world you can just take a step back look around the whole you know maze area and identify where all the things are uh, and other aspects are you need to kind of hit a switch or rotate um a, like a mechanism and then it will reveal another part of the uh, level or it will raise the floor you know so there's it's really intricate and really cleverly designed but um i think what's so kind of compelling about it, it again it's like feels like a really manageable challenge like i'm sure to perfect every mission I think there's like about 70 reportedly in the game. I'm sure will take like you know a lot longer than the way I'm breezing through it at the moment. But um, it's it's never off-putting, I guess. You know, and I think that's what I, I really appreciate that. It, you know, you get a sense of accomplishment you get in the star at, star at every at the end of every maze, but you know that you can go back and kind of like perfect your your run through. And so I imagine the price would drop slightly. It's not going to be a full price game i know nintendo games do hold their value but i would definitely say it's worth uh, picking up because i've enjoyed what i've played through so far and i'll certainly be continuing with that in the weeks to come i'm definitely up for that because let's face it mm. i need to follow through with me uh, toad prediction now <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah no it is great that they they kind of have responded to um the kind of positive reaction i guess to that aspect of um 3D world, and uh, I think I can remember sort of at the time that it was brought out, people suspected it might just be a short digital download title. Um, but the fact that they've really expanded it yeah, into this kind of like full retail game, although of course I've only played like a fraction so far, um, it's really interesting, and I, it's, it's also. Um, a, a nice kind of different challenge in the sense of the boss battles are not really heavily combat focused. It's more about like evading their attacks. Um, so like for example on an early one you face off against like this dragon and you have to just use the environment to hide from you know like he's um, you know when he breathes fire and you have to kind of like uh, scale around him until you get to the top of the level and then you know part of this rickety bridge falls down and bangs him on the head so <laughs> yeah it's got a lot of charm a lot of kind of um, kind of cartoon aesthetic appeal but it, it does just look beautiful it's, it's very much like the visual style of 3d world okay so i've been uh apart from a, a bit of dallying with um smash brothers and um playing a bit of rocket league uh especially the new uh what new new mode the mode they introduced over christmas um the snow days mode where the the pitch is covered in ice and they replace the ball with a, a hockey puck, <laughs> which uh, makes it completely changes the way the game plays. Like, luckily that they haven't covered the fact that the track's covered in ice doesn't affect the fact that the way that the cars handle, because they've got that spot on. And if your car was sliding around, it would just be unplayable. <laughs> Definitely. But the hockey puck handles completely different to the football, uh, and I actually find I prefer that mode to to regular Rocket League. Apart from those, uh, the main game we're playing through uh, is uh, Bloodborne trying to get that uh, playthrough done and uh, get the DLC completed in time for Dark Souls 3 when that comes out in April. It's still brutally difficult. I've come very close to breaking my controller or <laughs> my fist through the TV. <laughs> um, yeah, if, you, if you're easily frustrated by games, I would not recommend trying any of the Souls games or Bloodborne, but, uh, but I can't get enough of it because... Every time it smashes me down, I just keep coming back, keep getting back on that horse. And when you finally overcome the obstacle in front of you, there's, there's not many feelings in gaming that are better than that. Okay, so i definitely give that one a miss then, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> Probably, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so my game's complete opposite of Bloodborne. If you want to um, uh, yeah. avoid smashing your TV, avoiding breaking controllers... Avoiding spending money on controllers and spending loads of money on toys to life, then get Skylanders. Don't you just end up throwing your toys around the room, though? No, I end up, tr <laughs> I end up getting rid of them because I don't like them. <laughs> <laughs> They're not Lego. <laughs> so is, is this one the most recent? I Because you've obviously been playing a few of these. Are you doing it in kind of like chronology, chronology of release or are you mm. jumping back and forward? Yeah, this is uh, the fourth game in the series. This came out. 2014 um, it's got Skylanders Trap Team and 
Right, let's just talk about the positives. All right. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> the positives are brilliant graphics, absolutely amazing graphics, beautiful, beautiful to look at. Um, story is okay. Yeah, if you're a kid, you'll enjoy it. Um, there's a lot of things to do in it to 100% it. Um, nice little gimmick now where you can um, trap the villains and they give you, with a starter pack which I got, they give you two little traps, a water trap and a life trap I believe. And throughout the game you can press L2 and it'll bring the villain out from the trap and it'll give you some different moves and some unlockables. And so the negatives on this one are, because it's gone back to the original developer um, who did Spyro's Adventure and Giants, um, all the progress they made with Swap Force, all the variations of gameplay, all the where it seemed to be turning itself into a Ratchet and Clank type of game seems to have gone backwards. Where the gameplay is very basic, very rustic in its um, feel. There's a lack of variation. Okay, you can fly a, you're flying a bit of a spaceship at times, but it just seems a massive step backwards and everything. Um, also. Whereas in previous previous free games, you were able to unlock different areas if you had a normal Skylander, because each set comes with a special Skylander. So this one, you get a Trap Master um, special Skylander. All the areas that were on this game that are locked with the different elements, you could only unlock, unlock them with a Trap Master. You have to go out and buy seven more Trap Masters to unlock everything. Whereas before you could unlock them with normal Skylanders. It seems more of a... Um, rip-off. A money-making <laughs> machine. Yeah, a rip-off. I'm not gonna, yeah, it's a rip-off, basically, because in addition to buying all these Trap Masters, you have to buy additional six traps. And I think there's a lot more to collect, so you have to buy an undead trap. You have to, If you want an undead villain to trap and take it around you mm. in the game, you have to go and buy an undead trap. If you want a water, um, I think is it water or fire one? Anyway, that don't get in the pack. You have to go buy a fire trap. So, if you let's just say you had all of those um, accompanying packs, do you think that that would elevate the gameplay enough that it would be in keeping in what's come before, or do you think you're being uh, basically asked to spend far more money, but? on what is an inferior game in terms of the way it's been designed? The way it's been designed, you are spending a lot more money or being asked to, to unlock everything um, for an inferior yeah. game, in my opinion. So it is a bit of a, um, a downturn in its Skylander series. And when I complete Battle Charge, I'll, bit, I'll talk a bit about the series as a whole, but it is a bit of a disappointment, this one. Yeah. yeah. Not as good as SWAT Force. So, I mean... Any any positives there? Like, I mean, how many? How long have you been playing this one? Um, uh, it's about ten hours or so. But like I said, the graphics are good. You know, if you've enjoyed Giants and Spyro's Adventure, you'll enjoy this one. Um, you know, it's a good kiddie game. It's a good um, unlockables. A lot of unlockables. You get a lot of time out of it. It just feels, in terms of gameplay variation and how they've locked areas off. It seems just a massive um, downturn on it. It feels like you're held to ransom then. Yeah, yeah. In that sense, with uh, with buying traps and buying trap masters mm. to unlock everything, it does feel like on this on this version 2014, you were held more to ransom. Is this being run by EA? <laughs> um, Activision. <laughs> just as bad. <laughs> Activision. Activision. So, but previous games have been quite good. So, yeah. all right, you're not. If you haven't got all the Skylanders of the different elements, you're not going to unlock everything. But you, before you were able to unlock them, even if you didn't have, for example, all the giants, or you didn't have all the swap, mast, swap masters, you were able to unlock different areas of elements. But this one, if you've got, haven't got a trap master of that element, you ain't going to unlock it. So you got to go buy it. Hmm, that seems a little shady. Yeah. Hmm. But yeah, you know, I'm looking forward to the next one. The next one's meant to, I've heard good things about the next one. And it's got cars in it as well, so. Oh, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Have you got any idea how well Skylanders is doing at the moment? Because like for a while they were the only the only game in town. 
but now with Disney Infinity and uh, Lego Dimensions, they've got, they've got some very stiff competition. Yeah. So I don't know how well they're doing anymore. What I like to look, I had a quick look at the sales figures. Uh, the sales figures of and the only ones you can find are VG charts, and it seems to be decreasing. I don't think the last year's version sold as well um, as the as Lego Dimensions um, so it seems to be on a decreasing scale and I think that will probably be due down to maybe various developers and maybe Trap Team was defining one where they might have tried to um, make people get their wallet out a bit too much mm. Mm. Yes, it certainly seems that way yeah especially if you're a nagging parent of na- a nagging parent <laughs> <laughs> yeah child. that's not parents <laughs> <laughs> parent of a nagging child then you, yeah. you're really going to dig your heels in against something like this aren't you yeah you are I mean cause you can use all your old Skylanders in the games but in this game the old Skylanders have become a bit redundant because I couldn't unlock anything yeah yeah mm. so I had to, you have to go out and buy a trap mouse I'm not going to go out and buy a trap mouse I just want to complete the game and move on yeah so yeah it, it is a bit of a downturn in the series Apart from doing a lot of editing this week, um, the only bits of gaming I've done is uh, I did a couple of moves. I think I've done about three moves now on Blood Bowl 2 because um, Andy really piqued my curiosity on it. And uh, I started diving into that today, bizarrely. And yeah, I'm really enjoying that. But uh, again, I had to trail off and do other things, unfortunately. The only other decent thing I've had was um, Saturday night with you guys um, playing Mario Kart 8, which is always a hoot. Yeah, that was fantastic. (laughs) Although Mark didn't, you know, confess up front that he was bringing a ringer to the party and the fact that (laughs) his other half is supremely gifted at that game. (laughs) Definite hustler. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Um, My girlfriend Zoe, she's, uh, she's been playing Mario Kart quite a lot whenever she's been over. I thought she'd been playing it for years, but she, but she claims that the only other Mario Kart game she's ever played was the one on the Wii. So she must be naturally gifted at Mario Kart. But uh... no, she's definitely been playing it since birth. She's, <laughs> she's lying to you, Mark. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, um, <laughs> to play like that. Yeah, we had a, a really good session. We, were, we played for a good couple of hours on Saturday night. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah a great couple of hours. <laughs> yeah, um, it was a it was a good impromptu kind of session. I know that. Um, on Twitter, we had a couple of people say that they would have liked to have joined in, and you know, we'll maybe we'll try and look ahead to giving people a bit more advance notice because it'd be great to you know play with some of the listeners on there. Yeah, definitely. If we, if we could get a decent group of us together, I know the Saturday night was a little bit impromptu, so we didn't have enough chance to uh, to get the word out beforehand. Um, but it's just so much fun. I'd love to, I'd love to make it a regular thing. I've, I play quite a lot of racing games, but I say that Mario Kart 8 is probably my favourite of the bunch by quite a way. It's the online aspect as well, um, just the fact that you can jump straight in, you know, and it's not ke- keeping you waiting forever, and even if you are waiting, you're watching some somebody that you know playing, Yeah. you know, and um, it's only for like a, 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 a couple of minutes, and then you're in. Yeah. It's great. Yeah, matchmaking in uh, the matchmaking in most Nintendo games. I mean, sorry, considering that they have a very archaic attitude towards the internet, the matchmaking in their <laughs> yeah. games has always been very good, especially on the on the Wii U. And I, I remember when I had Mario Kart Seven on the 3DS. That was the only game I had on 3DS where the multiplayer functioned absolutely perfectly, um, much better than than a lot of like shooters and things like that I play, where it can be an absolute nightmare to get into games. Mario Kart, you're in in minutes. Mm. Uh, at most, usually you're in in seconds. It is phenomenal online. Yeah. Yeah, we should also say, you know, to any listeners maybe that, um, well, obviously if they think they are good at it, brilliant, they'd obviously come along, but um, even if you've only, you know, you haven't unlocked all the Grand Prix yourself or you don't consider yourself overly, overly kind of experienced with it, it was really competitive, wasn't it? Even though, like, obviously, we're not, some of us mm. are not very good, others are really good, you know, all that. <laughs> oh, it was yeah, still yeah, all right, but, yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I've got three thumbs, all right. <laughs> I, I, I have problems. <laughs> but I think from like a good multiplayer session on it, you go back into the single player, I think a better racer, because it's, it was just interesting to see, uh, you know, what kind of vehicles other people use, also how they, they approach certain tracks. Um, you know, like it's great as well that there's just so much content and it's just rotating, you're playing different tracks all the time. But after, if you play it for like two hours, some do 
you know crop up again and it, and it you know it, it just gives you not necessarily a lot of revealing shortcuts but because it's obviously so manic it's, it's quite hard sometimes <laughs> to work out what's going on but I, I certainly felt like I could go back into the single player having learned a thing or two you know playing with people who were better than yourself at the game. Well, I've learned from Mark that there is actually different specifications for different vehicles, which is kept yeah. really quiet <laughs> under his hat for a long time. <laughs> yeah, no, it was curious that they, Mark and uh, Zoe both played as bikes. You know, I just... yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've um, that was a new edition, I think, with Mario. I don't think that was in Mario Kart Seven either. Um, the bikes were in um, Mario Kart Wii, I think. Yeah, they were. They were yeah. in Wii as well. Okay, yeah. right. Okay. Um, so I, I'd always raced with carts, and when I first started out Mario Kart 8, I was racing with carts, and then when I started playing with the bikes, once you get used to it, they're a hell of a lot easier to get around the tight corners yeah, they are. than um, the carts are. So, yeah, bikes are definitely the way to go if you want to <laughs> be a little bit competitive online. Although, uh, there are, I, I've seen a lot of the best players will pick a very heavy cart and a very heavy racer. For a top speed, like a great top speed, yeah. Yeah, for the top speed, and somehow they manage to get them around the most painful of hairpin corners, and I have no idea how. I'll stick to playing Toad in a Caterpillar, thanks. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, my son keeps on at me to um, try and unlock that gold. I think you can get like a gold cart, a gold... Um, Mario Sheen, I think, and also yeah. like a gold, um, like everything about the customization of the vehicle can be gold. But I think I'm not entirely sure. I think do you don't have to get like three stars on every single race in every single class, like from fifty, hundred. And... It's going to take a while then. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think to get you have to get at least one star in every Grand Prix. That includes the the manic eye-watering 200cc mode you've also got to beat <laughs> and the backwards and the backwards yeah and the mirror modes oh, and you, you've also got to beat all of the time trials uh, set by the nintendo stuff that's it yeah. yes no. that's right <laughs> so i don't think i'll be doing that anytime soon <laughs> yeah good luck good luck on that one lee yeah <laughs> Okay then, so on with the news. Uh, first of all, uh, reported by Kotaku, GTA probably, well, GTA 5 probably won't be getting any single player DLC anytime soon. Uh, Take Two have reported their fiscal third quarter net revenue of $486.8 million, uh, which they claim is due mostly to stronger than expected revenues from GTA Online. And that combined with the fact that there's a lot of speculation that the model may be going to free to play in the future. Um, means that I don't think they'll be getting we'll be getting any single play GTA 5 uh, DLC anytime soon. They'll no. just keep adding content onto uh, GTA Online. Well, it's, it's still pretty good though because you've still got plenty to do online. Oh yeah, but yeah, and that does mean that one one of your wish list things are straight out the window after one week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a shame because uh, GTA 4 had. Um, with uh, The Lost and the Damned and The Ballad of Gay Tony, two of my favourite pieces of DLC in recent years. Mm. So it's a, it's a bit of a shame, but I'm, I'm still interested in when they first announced GTA Online, they did talk about how in the future they were hoping to introduce other cities as well, bring in um, Vice City and uh, Liberty City as well, and have those as, as places you could go to in the GTA Online. And so long as uh, Vice City is the original... 80s themed Scarface neon nightmare then I'll be quite happy with that and I guess if they do go like as a multiplayer only platform in the future if it's going to be like their cash cow possibly if they then able to focus on either a new IP or you know like I don't know you were saying you wanted you know, a sequel to Red Dead Redemption you know maybe they can still offer up that kind of meaty single player experience but just within a different franchise of their own yeah hopefully um, there's still a lot of things they can do with gta online there's there's a casino in the city which has just been locked since the game came out and there's been speculation ever since it came out that at some point they'd open that up to you know how like in, if you played uh, red dead redemption you could do it in the single player but a lot of people played it online as well uh playing poker and things like that yeah that was really good fun yeah if they could introduce some sort of like gambling with your gta dollars then 
they yeah. they sell even you more. You just want gambling without the fear of losing real money, don't yeah, you? Yeah, well, I don't think that will happen because well, <laughs> you, like, you can earn money in GTA Online at a pretty decent rate, especially if you play the heists. But they're still making they're making money hand over fist by selling those um, those credit cards for GTA Online at the moment. I mean, yeah, like they said that the lion's share of that nearly five hundred million came from well. from uh, GTA Online. So it does show what size of the user base they've still got. Then um, what two years after launch? Yeah, it's ridiculous. No, it's still an ongoing thing. It's still alive. It's because there aren't any multiplayer games out there quite like it, though. Uh, it's no, like, not at all. It's kind of like a, a an MMO sort of... Well, it's not even that. I don't even know how to describe it. <laughs> but it's like a persistent... You have a persistent character and you, you buy more property and buy new cars and, and new guns and new clothes and whatnot. And um, they're always adding things in there on a fairly regular basis for you to waste your money on. So... Uh, the model looks alive and well. And uh, I'm right in thinking you guys are, are working on like a, a GTA focused topic episode. Am I right? So uh, you know that would be good for the listeners to hear more of your, you know, your experiences and your take on that particular franchise. Oh yeah, it's great. Um, actually, it covers more about the effect of GTA on gaming and the world. Yeah, like the legacy. Got gotcha. yeah. Yeah. In at large, basically, it's it's uh, shaping up quite nicely. Okay, well, I look forward to hearing that, of course. Uh, so our next news story, also from Kotaku, is that uh, experimental maps are coming to Rocket League sometime in February. Uh, Psyonix have been uh, have confirmed that they'll be updating Rocket League with some new maps. Uh, one of them is going to be a circular pitch instead of the usual oblong pitch so it's probably be a little bit more like Aussie rules football um, they're going to bring in a, a map where every goal has two openings god that's going to be nuts <laughs> yeah that sounds interesting but finally the, the, the one that's got me most interested is uh, there's going to be a new map that does away with having a flat pitch and will introduce uh, ramps and underpasses and uh, floating platforms so you're playing so it'll, it'll, there'll be a lot more verticality in the way you play um, which could be quite interesting um, I'm practically vertical most of the time anyway because I'm running up the fences. Yeah. Oh my god, it's going to be a nightmare. <laughs> it, could, it could be an utter disaster, but it's nice that they're trying these things and they're still working with the model that these these sort of like updates with pitches are free. Mm. And the only thing you pay for are the packs with like new cars, and new decals, and new wheels and things like that. You pay for cosmetic stuff and the other updates like the, the one I mentioned earlier with the ice hockey mode is just completely free. Yeah. So, um... That game's definitely got legs on it. Tyrone Rodriguez, who's a developer for Binding of Isaac, uh, talked about on Twitter the other day how Apple have decided to reject Binding of Isaac Rebirth from the iTunes store. Um, they sent a message stating, Your app contains content or features that depict violence towards or abuse of children, which is not allowed on the app, and then the message cuts off and presumably they, they said Apple Store. Um, it's quite unusual. I mean, uh, Apple have had quite a long history with rejecting content from the iTunes Store that they view as distasteful, but considering that Binding of Isaac is on the Wii U and the 3DS, the most family-friendly of, of platforms. <laughs> it's yeah. quite bizarre that Apple have decided that it's too extreme for, for the iTunes store. It is a dark, kind of messed up game, but it's that's odd. This I isn't thought. one of those things where users can make a... Um, like a register a could sort of concern and then like an auto message is sent out this is it's nothing like that then this isn't something that's no this is a straight out rejection from the apple store before it's even been shown yeah as far as we see it hadn't even been on the on the itunes store yet it's just that they submitted it to be added to the store and apple said no yeah but this is bizarre because i can actually play carmageddon i've got carmageddon on my ipad yeah <laughs> <laughs> and we all know how family friendly that one is <laughs> don't know whether it's been flagged by the system automatically or whether someone at Apple has made the decision to reject it but yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll see well I, I, if it is somebody who's made a decision and they are being extra vigilant I wish they adopt the same uh, level of kind of scrutiny to the actual content and quality of a lot of the stuff that's on there because it is just it's, it has just become the shovelware store isn't it really it has yeah very much so although as far as i can gather it's still better than it is on android 
which has got the same problem that the steam does there's certainly more of it yeah <laughs> i'm saying nothing about it <laughs> <laughs> yeah there is there is a lot of crap on the android store G- yeah. going back to your saying it's on um wii u and 3ds i, I mm. yeah i was aware that one of uh, binder of isaac did come over but um what is the rebirth like um a remastered version or a an extra bit of DLC that's put because I, I thought there was only how many Binding of Isaac titles are there? Well, the Binding of Isaac this is the Binding of Isaac originally came out just on PC. It was just a, it was a very little game. It was the game that um, Ed McMillan made yeah. before um, Super Meat Boy, right? And I'm pretty sure it was just on PC. And then the Rebirth version was the one that came out on PlayStation platforms, and I think it's on Xbox as well. Yeah, and it was on PS uh, Plus, was 3DS. It, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's come out on pretty much everything. Right. Um, I think it was just like a remastered version with some extra content. Uh, I know that Nintendo originally um, had issues with it, but not on the grounds of the of, of the content regarding violence towards children, but more to, to do with running. the fact that it has... Uh, no, it was more to do with the fact that it had um, overtones of religious religiosity, I guess, oh, okay. um, to it, uh, mm. and criticism of, uh, that they were a little bit... Um, unsure of at first but they let it on pretty quickly after that and they had no 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 problems with any of the rest of the content of the game so apple being a little bit sensitive yeah no i only ask because um i'm noticing that there seems to be more and more of a trend where a game might come to like the 3ds or the wii u uh you know later on in the game's life cycle of which after it's mm. already gone to these other platforms but then if there's like some additions made on the other platforms like extra dlc or kind of like um a semi-sequel or somewhat they don't they don't then seem to be porting that over so it might be that you do get some aspects of certain titles but that they're not going to you know continue just because it's on there doesn't mean you're necessarily going to get um whatever future kind of installments are of that particular title. I mean, obviously it's different with something like um, Shovel Knight because didn't that originate on... That was like an original Nindy or whatever you call it. Like that was on Nintendo first, wasn't it? After yeah, Steam. that was Nintendo first. Yeah, yeah. and that, that obviously all the extra content that they, they've put out, uh, is it Yacht Club Games? You know, that's obviously gone mm. on to, you know, anyone who's bought that title. That's another great example actually of a company doing DLC properly. But um, yeah, no, I, I have to look into it, but I'm sure that it, I thought Binding of Isaac was one of the titles. I'm sure the listeners who know more will be able to correct me. Um, but there's certainly been other ones where you've got... Um, you know, even people saying like oh, they'd offer to port it to the three DS or whatever, but or they or they're not prepared to. Um, I'll look into it, but there's definitely been like at least three relatively high profile indie games where that seems to have happened, which is a shame. Next up, uh, Jesse Stern, a lead writer for Respawn Entertainment, confirmed with an interview with Forbes last week uh, that a sequel to um, Xbox One and PC multiplayer only shooter Titanfall is very much in development. And what is more, Titanfall 2 will apparently feature a proper single player campaign and as seems to be becoming more of a trend these days, a tie in TV series. Um, I mean, the What's the Xbox One game that's coming out soon that's supposed to have a TV series running alongside it? Yeah, but I thought that got cancelled, didn't it? The TV the, series got cancelled. Yeah, ah. Quantum Break. Quantum Break, it? yeah, because it's got yeah. actual TV actors in it, in the game. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not always 100% sure, but I thought it got cancelled. and has, has it made a big thing out of it, have they? No. Said? No, I mean, it's... Titanfall, I, remember, I don't know if you guys have played it at all on, on PC. I don't think any of us have got an Xbox One. No, no, no I haven't but I haven't played, but I've heard people that aren't necessarily into like, online shooters actually praise it and so they, they actually quite enjoyed it, especially the... Um, am I right thinking there's like a lot of jumping or verticality in yes, the gameplay? Yes, a lot yeah, of it. That, yeah. I remember hearing quite a lot of praise for that. So I'm, I'm sure the fact that you're saying it's coming back with a... Not just obviously online, but it's got a more meaty single player that should make you know. It's, I mean, it's got like a dedicated but small fan base, is it? This one, it's small being the operative word there. That's the thing. It's a, uh, um, <laughs> I would I've been holding up for Titanfall 2 because it's apparently coming to uh, more platforms than just Microsoft um, with the next one, which is why I couldn't play the first one because my PC can't handle it and I don't have an Xbox One. The, but the problem that people had with Titanfall, it wasn't too much to do with the fact that there wasn't a single player campaign or it was lacking a TV series, but it had more to do with the fact that it had a really short tail. Um, they brought out 
a fair amount of DLC for it, but as far as I can make out, not lo not that long after launch, within months, it was kind of difficult to get into matches because people just weren't playing it. Which is odd because when it came out, it was very well received both critically and uh, by the by, by gamers as well, and it looks incredibly incredible fun, but people weren't playing it for very long which is odd well i think it's because it was one of the launch games you know it was yeah. quite high up there and it was very high profile but it was followed so quickly by so many other large triple a titles that it kind of got swamped which was unfortunate i think if they'd have actually paced it out a bit quicker you know it, it would probably have had a bit more shelf life on it and talking about games with TV series running concurrently alongside them, what what lasted longest with the Defiance? Is like is, the, is that game still going on and the TV show still active? Like was that successful for them? Don't know. No idea about that. But that's like a that was a. I'm just, I think that was. I'm not. I was going to say it was a only PC, but actually I think it did come to console as well. But it's like an MMO, yeah, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. It came out on uh, Windows, uh, PlayStation Three, and Xbox Three Hundred and Sixty but wasn't very well received and kind of didn't sell very well. The TV series ran for three seasons on sci-fi and then got cancelled in <laughs> October. The Buffy the Vampire Slayer game did quite well though, didn't it? That had a fairly decent TV spin-off. <laughs> 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 and there was that those uh, successful uh, video game spin-offs to the um, Super Mario Brothers film as well. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> More on a towering achievement of cinema, that was. Oh, my God, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Apple Insider have uh, reported that Nintendo are due to debut their first smartphone app called Mitomo or Mitomo, <laughs> M-I-I-T-O-M-O, -O, in spring 2016. We know absolutely nothing about it. <laughs> Apparently nobody else does either. No. It's got something to do with your Mies, but <laughs> they haven't said anything to do with what the exact gameplay is. The report says that uh, in Miitomo, users can design their own Mii avatars, a feature in introduced with the Wii console years ago, and talk to other app users. But that's about it. That's all we know about it. <laughs> Isn't that just like PlayStation Messenger in that case then? Because that's the same kind of thing. It's just a message app, you know, and it's just something yeah. you use on your phone. Yeah, or maybe it'll be like um, PlayStation Home was, but on your phone. Well, um, I do know... We know what success that was. Yeah, that was fantastic, wasn't it? It was a resounding <laughs> success. <laughs> now, I'm just thinking, because uh, obviously I've looked into it a bit as well, and I found out that they're actually going to move your me to uh, cloud storage, which could perhaps hint that they're going to try and start moving your account to cloud so that you're not actually locked to your console anymore which would oh, be, be nice that would be an interesting development but looking at the app itself it looks bloody awful <laughs> 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 i'm not sold in the slightest but it's a step in the right direction so they say that they're going to do another four apps after this. They're releasing five between now and the start of March 2017. So, I don't know, it's a case of watch this space and see what happens, I reckon, with that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm pleased that they are now starting to talk, obviously, about these mobile apps because, you know, it was uh, mentioned that they were coming because surely if we can get the, dark, the discourse on this kind of aspect of their expansion into that market out there, we can then kind of bring something about the NX into the market because... You know, I almost feel like, can we just get this out of the way? And then we can obviously get to the NX, because surely they're going to... You'd imagine they're going to start talking NX, what, by the end of this financial year? Well, they'd probably... Yeah, I mean, we're hoping that there's going to be some sort of announcement, big announcement to do with that around the um, uh, Nintendo Direct to E3. Yeah, yeah, no, but not, I would have... Yeah, exactly, that's, that's what I mean. I, I would have thought that they would have got the conversation... Um, mm. you know going by now I mean I can kind of understand that they, they need, they're going to get this news out and maybe they're going to talk more about their strategy in that regard I mean I think also this it looks to me that this is aimed primarily at the Japanese audience and it is going to be more about expanding that um, almost that kind of like lifestyle market that they had you know like certain yeah. aspects of the DS and the and the Wii try to kind of go after that lifestyle aspect where you know you could have you could have like an um, on a DS cart, I mean, it seems mad now, but this obviously was happening before um, everyone had an iPhone and a tablet. But they were, they had like um, 
carts on there where you could like take to, you know take it with you shopping and kind of mm. like plan your meals and you also had that whole kind of range of um I can't remember what it was called now but it's like generations games so it had like various kind of quiz games and sort of mm. site training and things like that i don't know whether this is like more aimed towards the kind of like i guess the casual market but then again another part of it is it's maybe it's just more to do with social customs that in japan because don't people tend to take their 3ds to like meeting places like cafes and things like that so is it more that they would have more use for this kind of app than we would i reckon that's the case because um with the japanese market it does tend to be geared towards mobile rather than a console anyway so it's possible that that's what what they're trying to tap into you know before they actually um realize that they've got a sinking ship they've actually started <laughs> jumping it <laughs> yeah it's strange because you, you would have liked to have thought well it's probably a conversation for another time I, I wasn't expecting them necessarily to kind of like release what we would consider like traditional nintendo games on an on a mobile phone um but I would have thought they might have led with one of the ones that they felt was going to be the most enticing or the strongest. Whereas if this is the one that they're starting off with, it, it does make me think that possibly all of them aren't really going to be aimed at the kind mm. of hardcore, even slash casual uh, gaming market. It does sound a bit ass around tip. Yeah. <laughs> We've got that, uh, that Pokemon Go game coming out on mobile this year as well. Yes. No, you're right. And obviously they did, they brought over the, um, the free to play match three Pokemon game as well. What was that called? No idea. It was like a th they pushed it to the 3DS. It was a free to play, very much like you know, um, I guess like you call it your Candy Crush or your yeah. your Bejeweled, but it's with Pokemon characters. And then they ported that over to mobile, and actually that talks to each other. I think I think you can play that across both um, via the one signing. But I kind of dabbled with it and then kind of left it aside but uh, yeah i guess it's a case of watch this space and uh, mm. we'll see but yeah no kev you seem far from convinced <laughs> <laughs> I, I will sit on the fence and say uh, yes i could be a little bit jaded about this <laughs> yeah well it's, it's hard to say anything about it until we know what the hell it is well you know what nintendo are like they'll probably unleash it and suddenly it'll be just everywhere anyway i, I mean look at the wii when we've when I first saw the Wii, I thought, oh my God, what the hell are they releasing? What the hell is that? <laughs> no chance. That's not going to do anything. And then guess what? <laughs> Became the biggest selling console of all time. And they, and they did release that kind of Sims game, didn't they, on the 3DS? Is it Tam Tamadachi Life? And that, that you know, <laughs> yeah. that seems, you know, I, can't, I don't know the figures offhand, but I think that was generally well received. So I don't know whether they've got a... A, a grander scheme where these apps are going to allow you different functionality and then somehow they're going to give you like a virtual world like you were saying mark about home so maybe it is there is mm. a, you know an audience for that i did learn when i saw oasis back in 1994 <laughs> um i saw them live and i went these guys are going nowhere <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you know i'm probably not the best guy to look at for a pretty so basically Go the opposite of you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's it. So I'd embrace it. I embrace it wholeheartedly <laughs> now. <laughs> so our most underwhelming story to cause a fuss this week <laughs> is that uh, Polygon and numerous other grumpy websites have taken issue with the box art for the new Doom game because it is quote unquote terrible. <laughs> um, I've seen it, and yeah, it's quite generic. It's it's uh, just the, the, a picture of the main character head-on holding a shotgun with the word Doom in front of it, but 99.9% .9 of the box art for shooters are pretty boring anyway. So <laughs> And the Doom even worse. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, Doom's never had great box art, so on, I don't no. know who cares. As long as the game plays well, who, who cares, really? Well, I've seen some gameplay videos of it, and it looks absolutely fantastic. Yeah. It's exactly what you'd expect from a Doom, if not a lot more bloodier. You know, it looks ridiculously over the top, mm. this one. You've just got blood all over the place. Um, but the graphics, I'm tempted to say that it still looks a lot last gen. Very brown. So far. Very, Probably, very brown, yeah. yeah. But it also looks a lot faster than... Uh, what I got from yeah. watching the video uh, Bethesda's conference E3. It seems to be a, a hell of a lot faster, which as someone who used to love playing uh, Unreal Tournament, that's, that's definitely something I'd be interested in. 
So. I still can't play it because it's first person and scary. <laughs> <laughs> I just stick to the multiplayer, it'll be fine. <laughs> oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and finally, uh, the biggest story of the week is that EA have decided to pull out of uh, E3 2016 um, following Nintendo and deciding that they, they no longer need E3, which is uh, quite big news because they were one of the big um, tentpole uh, conferences of, of the weekend. So now we're left with Sony, Microsoft, Ubisoft, and nobody really cares about Square Enix. And um, <laughs> and uh, Bethesda have, have confirmed that they'll be returning, but after... With what? Uh, Doom? <laughs> yeah, I guess. that's already going to be out. <laughs> but are you, saying that, are you saying they're not uh, going to have any presence? I mean, or are they just going to be more like they, they have a pre-recorded video, like a, like a direct... Yeah, they're going to have their own thing, and they'll still have a presence on the on the show floor at E3 for you to be able to go and play, play games. Kind of like... Nintendo still has a presence on the show for E3. Yeah. They just don't have a presentation anymore. Is this like when a band did a video for Top of the Pops? <laughs> <laughs> could have a start. It could have a start. Yeah, possibly, yeah. <laughs> but, um, I mean, if, if other developers decide that they also don't want... I mean, if Ubisoft decided to take suit, you'd be left with Microsoft, um, Squeenix, mm. who, again, nobody cares about... And uh, and and Bethesda, like, at what point does E three lose its relevance? If if uh, well, uh, be start it, pulling depends, out? it depends what perspective you're going to look at it from. I mean, ultimately, let's just say EA did go down the Nintendo route and they released like their own kind of pre recorded videos, and other developers and publishers did that. If it meant more regular uh, announcements, more regular contacts directly <laughs> to their audiences then i think actually like the, the, the games players themselves w wouldn't wouldn't see it as a massive loss i think isn't e3 much more about um you know journalists and the actual industry yeah. itself as yeah a, a kind of showcase so I, I, for, I your average gamer i think whilst it will be a culture shock because obviously we're all so used to getting so hyped for e3 mm -hmm. and that's obviously what the the, you know the money side of the business is is relying on um, this the big kind of like event mentality. But the fact is, yeah, if we we're able to, you know, hear directly from the people that are making the games and they're able to kind of like control and manage their message, I can I can understand why they would want to do that. I mean, it's clear that it has actually worked for Nintendo in in a lot of respects. Mm. Um, even though you know you'll still get industry analysts saying no, they need to return you know, to the stage. And, you know, I think some people are hoping they might for, um, you know, E3 and the NX. Unloaded. Surely they're just recognising a shift in how things are done these days, you know, because let's face it, the E3 thing, it's basically like a Vegas sideshow anyway. And um, it's something that's been running for years, you know, and uh, let's face it, it's looking a bit old as a concept, you know, it's just basically a sales show, you know, it's like going to see the International Toy Fair or something like that. And, you know, it's, it's technology. My God, these these companies could do a damn sight more just by unleashing something on YouTube these days than they could, you know, they could just release a, a video on YouTube and it'll cost them nothing as opposed to thousands and thousands of dollars to set up a stupid stall that's going to sit there for yeah. a weekend. Yeah. Yeah, and I know, I know. Obviously, E three attracts loads of millions of of watchers of the actual presentations. Yeah. you know, so the audience is On far YouTube. bigger than. The, <laughs> well, yeah, the big the audience is far bigger than the actual people that attend the event. But uh, there is still a disconnect, um, unconscious or not, where you are watching a video of somebody talking on a stage to another audience, <laughs> yeah. whereas in an actual video. You know, it pulls the the magic of being able to directly address its audience. It makes you feel mm. like you know that is a message in um, being curated for you specifically. And I think also it will it would help remove this kind of um, bo bottleneck. You know, of when all these games have got to be ready by. You know, and they've yeah. got to be able to be shown at E three. Whereas you know they could be more drip fed and spread throughout. Like, all, all the quarters of the year, you know, they, and they can focus on individual titles. I mean, you'd probably end up getting more information. And I think ultimately as a consumer, people would be more interested in that. Mm. But I don't know. I mean, that's just, I'm just saying it completely, obviously, as outside of the industry. I, mean, I take it, Mark, you see it, you think it's a bold move and you're not necessarily 
happy about it. Oh, well, no, it's not a case of not being happy about it. I mean, it, it makes no difference to me either way. But I, I would say that it would pro- if this becomes a trend and more publishers decide to pull out of E3, it could have quite an effect on um, the game journalism industry because for a lot of websites, E3 week is their biggest week for traffic. Yeah. And if E3 is no longer as relevant as it used to be, um, that's going to have a big dent in uh, in their in their viewership over over those those that crucial week. No, I agree, and I guess it's also that whole idea that you know they get privileged access, and that makes mm. their site um, appealing, doesn't it? Like if they yeah. they know something that we don't, and they're the they're the conduit for the message. They're the ones who can relate it to us. That obviously gives them their prestige and power. Whereas that would be kind of like eroded massively. I mean, of course, they're still going to have you know the the, the the industry needs the media to be able to function so they'd still need to be able to show things to those outlets so they could spread the word but you're right it would it would definitely mm. um it's like obviously now with live tv and like things like that now you, you used to get people who would like plan their their week around something that might be on the telly because you couldn't you know if you didn't watch it there and then live mm. you would miss it <laughs> whereas obviously <laughs> the world's moved on drastically from that so <laughs> yeah. you know like even sort of stadium sports events are in, you know the audience figures are down because i don't know we're just sort of changing our attitude to how we consume the media and i just think yeah I think for some people i don't think it'll raise an eyebrow that they that when they hear that the three might suddenly start putting out you know nintendo direct style videos yeah i mean like to be honest ea and ubisoft uh both of their press both of those companies their press conferences have been quite boring over the last few years and at times just downright awkward so um yeah it's a skill isn't it to do like a really yeah. good show at e3 and it's so seldomly done um so again i think that if they're able to control the message they're able to mm. kind of pre-record it all um I mean, I think that's that was definitely in Nintendo's mind when they decided to make that shift. Um, you know, they were able to present themselves in a more professional and slick way than they were able to do live. In a way, far more entertaining way as well. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, incredibly, cre- much more creative. Yeah, because they were mm. able to get over a lot of the kind of spirit of the company, which they weren't able to do via someone just standing at the front speaking, you know, of it, yeah. whether it be the language barrier <laughs> or lack of charisma. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I hope that, that Microsoft and Sony continue to do the press conferences, though, because those tend to be a little bit more interesting because they're talking more about the platforms themselves and mm. and the, the exclusive titles. And this year's going to be a, a, a big year, f- I, I think, for um, Sony trying to push um, Morpheus or whatever it is they're finally going to call that. And Microsoft with their, um, I can't even remember what it's called, their weird holographic VR augmented reality thing oculus is that what you mean no no, no oculus uh, is, um, microsoft have got the um hololens hololens that's it yeah oh, i thought it was called lawnmower man sorry <laughs> 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 so yeah like we said bethesda are going to be back again but what it is they're going to announce so i can't imagine their press conference is going to be very exciting and uh fallout dishonored t- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. another elder scrolls uh it's, Elder Scrolls yeah. Remastered. Yeah, if they announced Skyrim Remastered, I'd be quite happy. But um, apart from that, it could be um, mm. a, a slightly less interesting E3 without EA being there. It could make no difference at all. It will yet to see. Hmm. So just a heads up um, for uh, Laps Gamer Radio coming up in the uh, next few weeks. Uh, we're going to be playing through a Grim Fandango Remastered, uh, which was released free on PS Plus recently on uh, PS4 and Vita. Um, don't know if it was, was it on PS3 as well? Uh, not on the PS Plus, I don't think. No, no. Um, but you can also pick it up on, on various other platforms as well. There's, there's quite a, a long list of platforms it's available on now. So if you'd like to play along with that, then uh, you've got a few weeks to get that played before we'll talk about that. So. Get it played, uh, shoot us over your thoughts, and uh, we'll read those out on uh, a future podcast. Yep, and if you're a, you know, <clears throat> a veteran fan of that game, and you know, you'd know you like to come on and talk about this remastered version of Double Fine's you know, adventure game, then you know, let us know, because we're happy to have you know, guests on whenever we can arrange that. So, if, uh, as again, if you'd like to uh, contact us, then there are various forms you can get in contact with us via. Uh, you can email us at lapsgamerradio at gmail.com. Uh, you can tweet at us at Lapsed Gamer, and there's the uh, Lapsed Gamer Radio Facebook page. 
Um, we should have, hopefully, some content going up um, to the Laps Gamer YouTube channel at some point over the next few weeks as well. So uh, be sure to look out for that and leave us your comments. Yep. So if you've got any kind of questions or anything really that you'd like us to read out or discuss on the show, then do get in touch. Uh, you can find our podcast episodes uh, to stream or download via Pod, uh, Podbean web address. That's lapsgamerradio.podbean.com or just search for Laps Gamer Radio on iTunes. So we hope you've enjoyed our uh, initial run at a lapse look of the news. Uh, this episode is a, a little bit longer than we'd planned, but uh, hopefully be getting a little bit tighter in, in the coming weeks. Uh, if you've got any comments or any feedback, then uh, do be sure to let us know. And uh, thanks for listening and goodbye. Goodbye. Bye-bye. See ya.